Trek Geeks is proud to have Fansets as its presenting sponsor. Fansets is the place for amazing pin collectibles with over 400 officially licensed Star Trek pins and new releases every month. Stay tuned for a special discount code good on your next order at fansets.com. Fansets. Our pins have character. A voice from the past in grave danger, reuniting with an old friend, and commandeering a starship. That should be easy, right? The amazing final season of Star Trek Picard is concluded, and now we begin our look at this amazing reunion of the crew of the Enterprise D. Beverly Crusher is in trouble, and in reaching out to John, Jean-Luc Picard, she tells him to trust no one, including Starfleet. It's the start of a wild ride in season three, and we're glad you're here to take it with us. I'm Bill Smith, and we are Discovering Trek Picard. Thanks so much for joining us, and welcome to Discovering Trek, the Star Trek Universe Companion, presented by Fansets. Star Trek Picard's final season brings together some iconic characters for an amazing last mission together, and we're going to kick off our analysis of it with episode one, titled The Next Generation. Hey, that's got a really nice ring to it, doesn't it? Before we get into too much detail about this amazing season, I have to introduce my crew here in this lonely little shuttle pod here on Discovering Trek Picard. Here to help break down the first episode is my good friend and fellow Trek Geeks podcaster, Jamie Rogers. Jamie, uh, welcome to Discovering Trek Picard. I have a feeling you might be excited to talk about this. Uh, you know me, I'm always excited to talk about my next generation cast, you know, my Trek, obviously, and I'm excited to break down uh, season three, where we know we got the whole, the whole cast back together again. You know, one of the nice things is kind of doing this in a rear view window. I mean, you figure that's what Star Trek podcasts were for years. And we kind of have the benefit of knowing how this season ends as we talk about these episodes. And I think that's pretty interesting. Um, we're still going to focus clearly on episode one, but we may drift down the timeline in our discussions a little bit, and that's okay. But in the meantime, let's talk about episode 301. The Next Generation is written by Terry Metalis and directed by Doug Arniakoski. After receiving a distress call from Beverly Crusher, Jean-Luc Picard enlists help from generations old and new for one last adventure, a mission that will change Starfleet and his old crew forever. Originally released on February 16th, 2023, it is the first episode of Star Trek Picard's third and final season. Well, let's dive right in, Jamie. I mean, um, there's a lot to dig in here in this first of the 10 episodes. Um, a lot of great exposition. And a lot of elements that I can imagine they're going to call back to in the future. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, we really see that Terry Metalis, he, he's a Star Trek fan. I mean, he's a next generation fan yeah. through and through. And it's like not even just the next generation elements, but the Wrath of Khan elements are like all over the place. You know, the Wrath of Khan sound effects, the, the music, it, it just... Uh, all I can think of is this nostalgic elements. That's how I feel as I'm as I'm watching this episode. You know, especially that opening scene, right, where we see Picard's log from Best of Both Worlds. Yeah, I'm actually doing a rewatch of Next Gen right now, so to hear that log the, from Best of Both Worlds is is awesome. I love the Enterprise painting. Obviously, that was uh, you know, oh. from the Ready Room. I mean, it, it's just. The nostalgic elements really puts me back in my days of watching TNG. So it was something I really appreciated watching this episode. You know, I kind of get the sense that the theme that we kick off here is that kind of everything old is new again. You know, you get the really kind of old time music to kick off the episode. You get the log entry, as you mentioned, the nostalgia, the music even. And that's one of the most important characters in this season. We get variations on themes from other Star Trek from James Horner, Jerry Goldsmith, Jay Chataway, Jeff Russo, and uh, all with original music kind of wrapped around it, which I think is really kind of fascinating. It tells us that while this is familiar it's still something very, very different, wouldn't you say? Oh, absolutely. Like I said, I love how he's like weaving in Wrath of Khan stuff with Next Generation. It's just, it's so, so good. But you're spot on with the music. The music was fantastic. I mean, I cannot say enough good things about the music and the sound effects. And it just, 
it, it really put me back in the moment of this is what I've been waiting for when I've watched the first two seasons of Picard. You know, this is this is what I want. This is yeah. what I want to see. Speaking of familiar but different, let's talk about Beverly Crusher. Because obviously her entrance into this episode is very striking. It's very bold. Um, I, I think that this probably sets the tone for the entire season. And honestly, this is the most kick-ass we've ever seen Beverly Crusher. And this is better than anything she got to do in any of the four feature films. Yeah, no, I 100% agree with you. And, and they, it, it's interesting too, this you know, concept of the fact that she kind of cut out the rest of the crew members too, and kind of went on. I, I almost feel she kind of mirrors how Jerry Ryan was, you know, the seven of nine character from season one okay. of Picard, you know, how she kind of w- became that mercenary, that rogue, um, that pirate almost to a certain extent. That's, it's kind of what, what Beverly's become. And, and yeah, it's great. She's got the, you know, she's got the phaser out. She's, you know, she's kicking butt. Um, I just I did think it was kind of a weird story element though too that she kind of cut out the rest of the crew, um, you know, and obviously we see that you know she had the relationship with Picard and you know it kind of didn't go so well, <laughs> so to speak. But it, it was a surprising plot choice for me that she kind of cut out uh, the rest of the crew. I didn't really see that coming, um, but it set up kind of an interesting you know way for her to kind of reach out. And, you know, for Picard to obviously want to help her because he hadn't heard from her in, in so long. And there's that bond. There's that that connection. Agreed. I, I kind of feel like it's in the same way of, you know, when you have old friends and your lives kind of drift apart and maybe you intend to, maybe you don't, but you, you, you don't communicate as often or, you know, your lives go in such completely different ways that they're not the same as those other people anymore. Maybe you feel like you don't have anything in common. I think in Beverly's case, it was probably a very specific choice um, because, um, you know, in not being with Jean-Luc, that means that every now and then they got to get the band back together and awkward, you know? Yeah. Well, and she's got to explain who her passenger is too, right? And, and I, I know, know right? Skipping the time, you the know. Passenger, she... The passenger, yeah. she locks in a compartment for some reason, yep. which I still haven't figured out, but well, um, that's definitely not an important detail in this episode. Um, no, so, so I have a question. If Picard weren't in the process of packing up the Chateau, would he ever have known that Beverly needed help by hearing that old combat? <laughs> no, apparently not. No, no. It, I mean, it, it's, you know, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's kind of, it's kind of funny. I mean, it works for me. Don't get yeah. me wrong, but it, it made me wonder as I was watching it again, I'm like, so if he had just decided to keep making wine and just live on the Chateau in La Bar with, with Laris, um, does he ever find out about the combat signal? Um, or does it happen too late when Earth is assimilated by the Borg? Yeah, Skipping ahead. Feel, Sorry, spoiler alert. No, I, and I feel like it, it was like so faint. It was like literally like, he, he had to be in the right room at the right time. Yeah. You know, he had this little chirping going on, but no, I agree with you. It was kind of, uh, you know, they, you know, and, and I know why they did it because Same. they, they knew we were going to just light up when we saw that TNG red uniform, mm-hmm. that old school badge, which looks fantastic at fans. That's too, by the way, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Sponsor they, plug, nicely done. Yeah, they they knew we were going to love seeing that. You know, I, I got excited. I got excited, but no, it was it was definitely Same. an interesting way to introduce, you know, her distress call. Two things that that really grabbed me about this scene and just made me scratch my head as an IT professional. One, um, Picard's password is still four seven Alpha Tango. Um, it's been thirty years, dude. You got to change that. I'm surprised he remembers it as a as a 95 year old admiral. <laughs> I know, and that's a great point. Why is a 95 year old retired admiral in a synthetic body the only person who can save the world in every season? I love it. Don't get me wrong. No, and the interesting part about that too is, okay, he's a he's an admiral. He's been around for he's a legend. Why can't he just go to? I know she said don't involve Starfleet, but it's like he's got no pull at all with None. anybody in Starfleet. You know, you know what I mean? Like Rafi in season one, when they were trying to 
get a ship. Like she had more pull than he did. I mean, yeah, I don't know. That that part was kind of crazy to me that they got to sneak around. Like he should have had some. I mean, he should have some people other than you know the cast and crew of uh, the one seven hundred one D that that should be able to help him. Speaking of which, I mean, we see the return of Will Riker again. Um, you know, I got to say, if we had to pick an MVP for this episode and maybe even this season, for me, I, I think Jonathan Frakes has to be right up there. This version of Riker, I think, probably is my favorite. Um, I didn't think this was possible, but Riker is even warmer and more charismatic than I think ever before. And I think Jonathan, you know, who only a couple of years ago had some some nervousness about coming back to the role, um, really just knocks it out of the park. Oh, he was, he's fantastic. And, and it's funny, you know, I, I mentioned that I'm doing a rewatch of TNG and I, I just got to best of both worlds. And, you know, there's that scene between Beverly, where, between Deanna and, and, and Riker, where she says, Oh, you're a little more seasoned. And I, I thought of that scene, you know, when I was watching yes. Picard season three, that scene was playing through my head. He looks seasoned. He looks seasoned as an actor, even though he's been out of the game for a while. But he, he just – the character has just matured in a way that I liked the progression. I mean, I liked seeing him in season one. Don't get me wrong. I love that episode yep. of Nepenthe. But, um, you know, he's making pizza. It just – this was the the type of Riker that I wanted to see um, as we start, you know, this first episode of season three. I feel like despite some obvious potential family problems – Riker is more comfortable in his own skin. Um, I feel like he's more at ease. You know, he doesn't have to make all the decisions. He doesn't have the lives of everybody on his ship, you know, riding on his every, you know, decision in the moment. He's just Will Riker. Um, you know, and I, I think that, I think that Frakes wears it well. And I think that the scenes with Jonathan and Sir Patrick together are just gold in this episode. Yeah, no, Absolutely. Absolutely. I um I I think it's great also speaking of other returning characters it's always awesome to see Jerry Ryan in Star Trek it's even better that Seven looks thoroughly miserable when we meet her on the Titan A and like she's regretted putting on that uniform ever since she was talked into doing it um you just they walk out of the the shuttle bay and there she is looking like yeah maybe I really would rather be somewhere else but here's my friend yeah Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's funny though. It, it seems like she's been miserable throughout Picard <laughs> yeah. in general. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she was miserable in season one, um, kind of miserable in season two, you know? So I, I think, I don't know. I, I like to see how her character obviously of what we kind of, we do see how she evolves throughout the season, but, um, it is interesting and it kind of plays into, you know, Captain Shaw too, is what, what are we getting from this, this captain that we got here on the ship, you know? And for me, you know, I feel like they're kind of, and I, and I like it. I like it. And I know we see Captain Shaw develop throughout the season, but I love the fact that he comes right out as, as almost like the bad moral character that we remember from the original series. Like, like boy, man, he just—he doesn't care who's sitting in front of him. He doesn't care what they've done. It doesn't care. He's gonna say what he feels. And this guy's got some bitter bitterness towards um, the two people that are in front of him for sure. Really, the three if you count seven. Yeah. Um. Well, this brings up a good point. I mean, because Shaw obviously is created in a way where we're designed to not like him. Off, right off the bat. Yep. I mean, he starts dinner without everybody. Right there, telegraphs that this guy is is a jerk. Um, but is he bad? Or do we just perceive him that way? Because he's not immediately acquiescing to Picard and Riker. Yeah. You know, he's not fawning over them and bending over backwards. Um, you know, if we if we juxtapose it, if if their roles were reversed and Shaw were an admiral coming on board the Enterprise to ask them to change, you know, tell them he wants to change course. What would Picard say? And I'm pretty absolutely. sure he'd say no. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I like the fact that, you know, and I had to put myself in the, in the minds of a captain too, is, you know, he's, he's thinking about his crew. He's thinking about his ship and he's saying to himself, okay, are these guys going to put me in a position where I'm going to put my crew at risk 
or my ship at risk or my command at risk. What are they asking me to do? Right. And, and that's maybe he's being a good captain, you know, but just his yeah. approach and his bedside manner is, you know, leaving something to be desired, but the actor plays it so well and is so believable. You know, it, it's like you said, you want to hate him in the beginning, but you're like, man, he's a good actor doing it. You know, Todd Stashwick is just so fantastic. I mean, even in just this first scene, we see him as Shaw. He clearly, you know, sets a tone of what this character is going to be. But you know that there's going to be more. You don't want to hate him because he he's, he's a Starfleet guy. He's generally not bad, but he's treating the people we admire like dirt. I mean, he's petty, right? Yeah. He puts Picard and Riker in bunk beds. Yeah. You know, a retired admiral and a captain who have saved the planet and the galaxy countless times over and he sticks them in bunk beds like they're like they're cadets. Yeah. Um that says something about who Shaw is. Yeah. Um and there's some room for growth. Oh, well, absolutely. But you know, once again, like I, I think back to how TNG started, you know, and Gene Roddenberry's vision of that original TNG to it's gonna be no conflicts between any of the main characters. It was like, you know, we, we hadn't really seen the baddie yet that we were gonna see in the season, but we, we had to give some sort of counterpoint. We we couldn't just have the Admiral, we couldn't just have this, you know, captain say, Yeah, let's go on this mission that I know nothing about and you know, they had yeah. to have some sort of counterpoint there to our beloved characters of, of Riker and Picard. I mean, essentially, they're trying to commandeer a starship, yep. you know, <laughs> take it somewhere other than it's really supposed to go. And yeah, like you said, they're putting the crew of that entire ship at risk. Um, that That's a potential problem. And I'm sure that's on Shaw's mind. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have a feeling that we're going to love Shaw more and more as the weeks go on, as much as we really hate the things he does. Um, one of the things I saw that was interesting were people were comparing him to like Captain Jellico. And I think that that's not even a fair comparison because it's a completely different situation. You know, what's something else I was wondering, Bill too, is I wonder how much of the crew served under Riker as well. Right. Because yeah, if you think about it, and you, you brought up Jellico as, a, as an excellent comparison, was Jellico necessarily a bad captain? We didn't really see enough to really make that judgment. I mean, some people say yes, some people say no. You know, his approach, but his approach was so different than Picard, you know, that the crew bristled against it. You know, they were used to Picard's style. So th this may be a similar situation here, right? He's coming yeah. into a crew that had Riker as their captain, or maybe some of the crew had Riker as their captain, and he's got to fight against that, and, and he's got a different way about him, a different style, and you know, maybe people aren't warming up to him. We don't know. We we don't know what the situation is, but you know, I was kind of thinking about that as as we're having this discussion about Shaw's. You know, maybe that's another thing. Maybe he sees Riker and he's just like, you know, you're the guy that I've had to undo or change right, certain things right. because you had it a certain way and you were loosey goosey and how you did stuff. And, you know, Mr. Jazzman and all that other stuff, <laughs> Mr. Jazzman. What, whatever, whatever derogatory uh, insult he was hurling his way. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think that at, at this point, I mean, we're one, uh, one episode in on Picard season three. I think it's at this point, it's safe to say that both Jellico and Shaw may not be the best people managers, but as far as their status as captains, it's really hard to say. Yeah. Um, we have to believe that they're competent because they are the masters of their vessel. But I have a feeling there's more complex things regarding both of them. We didn't get that deep dive into Jellico because it was really only, you know, portions of two episodes. But we're going to build on this with Shaw and learn much more about him. And uh, and this, I'm really excited for this journey because, like we said, Todd Stashwick just kills it, you know, even in the very first episode. So we know there's even more better stuff coming. Yeah, it's fantastic. Speaking of fantastic, let's talk about Rafi. Um, I'd love to see Rafi back. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I didn't buy for a minute that she had fallen off the wagon. No, I didn't either because I felt like... If they wanted to go down, down that route, it was going to take too much of the season to kind of unravel that web. So I didn't buy it for two seconds. And it looks like she's doing, you know, special 
investigations for Starfleet intelligence, which I think is fantastic. I think that suits her. I think it's a good role. It's weird that she's the only person aboard the La Serena. Um, okay, I'll take it. Yep. Um, but she has quite the quandary on her hands trying to figure out this whole red lady thing at the beginning of the episode. And then by the end, um, it looks pretty dire. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I liked her in that section 31 role too, because if I if I remember correctly, in, even in episode one, we kind of saw hintings that she was part of Starfleet Intelligence before, and you know, she got kind of roped into, you know, doing the the Romulan peace mission with Picard and stuff like yep. that. So yep. I, I definitely think it's a role that suits her and and you know, obviously we know how the season progresses and develops here, but um I think it was the perfect role, a perfect transition from where she was in season two to season three. I think so too. I, I appreciate that it gives her the moment to, you know, after she purchases the 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 drug of some kind, um, it gives her the perfect moment to to make a clear decision, you know, and to show that you know she's really still in control. Yeah. Uh, for those people who who did buy into it, and that's fine. Um, but I, it clearly declares that she has you know, her wits about her. She's clearly still on the wagon, you know, and she's, she's doing some really, really tough work for Starfleet with a handler. That's not very cooperative. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> wonder who that, I wonder who that's going to be. I know. Who could that be? It must be, uh, it must be Deanna. Yeah. No. <laughs> did, now, when we were watching this first run, um, did you know, did you think you knew who the handler was right off the bat nope. or did you have any guesses? No, I mean, I, I felt it would be somebody in, in the main cast and crew. Um, but I, had, I, I, I couldn't guess who it was by any stretch. I'm going to fess up to thinking it was Janeway at first. Oh, cause it, it was a good way to sneak in a cameo from Janeway. Yeah. Um, I was obviously wrong yep. and I'm happy to be wrong. I wasn't thinking along the lines of of Terry Metalis clearly, and yep. uh, it, it was a much better decision on his part because mine wouldn't have been as good. No, absolutely. <laughs> no, I I love who it who it turned out to, and I know you you kind of alluded to the fact that you know Riker was your favorite character this season. I love Worf this season. I know we haven't seen him yet in this episode, totally. um, but he's my favorite. This it, I, it's like Riker's like a close second to Worf. I just think his deadpan comedy this season's phenomenal and i can't wait to start talking about them in some of the later uh discovering trek episodes for sure one of the th one of the things i like about this episode and this season overall is that we let our characters age gracefully you know this is something we did really well with the original series cast in in star trek's you know two and four and six um you know we we pointed out that yeah they're older but I mean, when stuff is happening, I mean, they're going to do what Starfleet officers do. This this episode is telling us that that these people still have things to do. You know, their, their adventures are not over. And I think that's an important lesson. You know, as I look at this episode as, you know, as a guy in my 50s now, um, I'm definitely not as young as I was when I first started watching Star Trek, but I feel like I still have stuff to do. And so yeah. I can appreciate the roles that these characters are in. Yeah. And, and they're doing things of substance too, you know, like it's not yeah. just, it's not just stuff to keep busy. And and you're absolutely right that how Terry Metalis has kind of bridged that gap of, I don't want to say he's almost made season two non-exist, but it's like, he kind of just, he kind of almost skipped right over that. And I like how he's kind of grounded the characters into, you know, kind of retirement, but still with things to do and, and a purpose out there. Well, it goes back to what I said at the top. Everything old is new again, you know? Yeah. Um, but more importantly, everybody has value to add. And I think that's equally an important lesson here. Um, you know, whether it's Riker or Picard or or Rafi or Seven or, or, or whomever. Or even, you know, the the Ensign LaForge at the helm. You know, you get Sidney LaForge, Crash LaForge, you know, the the next generation, if you will. Everybody has something to contribute. And I think that that's one of the things that Star Trek has always tried to teach us. And I think it's really on display here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, I, and you brought up Sidney LaForge too. I love that. That's kind of like a, almost a, 
a callback to generations. I, I know your feelings on generations, but it's almost a callback to Sulu and his daughter, you know, his daughter being at the helm yeah. of the Enterprise B. You know, it's like, it's just kind of, you know, this is what I love about what Terry Metalis is bringing. He's bringing somebody who has a real in depth knowledge of Star Trek lore. And he's just, he's pulling these elements that, you know, your, your hardcore fans are going to just immediately gravitate to, you know, and I immediately saw that connection. I was like, Oh man, that's great. You know, another, you know, another, uh, your daughter from, uh, you know, a, a famous, uh, character. Absolutely. Let's talk about that portal weapon for a second. Cause that could mess up somebody's whole day. Ooh. Um, what, you know, you know, Rafi's investigating you know, these, these weapons, these experimental weapons stolen from Daystrom station. Um, when you see that portal weapon, you know, kind of go off for the first time and sort of destroy that entire complex in District 7, I'm not going to lie, my jaw might have dropped a little bit. Yeah. Um, because it essentially took what amounts to or looks like a something stadium sized and picks it back up and drops it. Yeah. Um, that's pretty scary. No, it, it, it definitely was. Definitely an interesting... Um interesting thing that we're going to see kind of develop throughout the season here, but yeah, no, it kind of uh, gave me chills and kind of set me back for a second when I saw that too. Like, Oh boy, this is going to be something uh, paramount in this season for sure. <laughs> yeah. Paramount. I see what you did there. <laughs> nice. Uh, so, and, and kind of lastly, um, how do we feel about the Neo constitution class Titan a um, let's talk about that ship for a little bit because we talk about everything old is new again. Um, let's talk about that ship design. Fantastic. It's fantastic. I, I love it. I think it looks great. Um, yeah, don't, I don't know what else to say about it. I, I think it looks fantastic. My, the TMP refit is probably my favorite starship ever. I mean, I, I love, you know, a lot of ships, but you know, the TMP refit, not the 1701A, mind you. I mean, the 1701 for Star Trek, the motion picture, um, holds a special place in my heart. And to kind of see a little bit of a redesign on it, see, you know, that thing is bulked up on impulse engines. My word. Um, that's a lot of impulse power that that ship is packing. Yeah. But um, it it's it's big. Yeah. That Titan is, uh, is a piece of machinery. And I got to say it, I was kind of surprised that they kind of went with that sort of new retro design, but it really, really works in this episode. It really no, does. absolutely does. It's, and and you know, I'm in the same boat as you. That refit Enterprise. I mean, I, like I know you know, I've told you this in the past. Motion picture was the first thing of Star Trek I ever saw. First yeah. thing I ever saw, and that scene in Dry Dock was like. <laughs> You know, that made me feel like it was real, that, like Star Trek was real yeah. to me. And so seeing that and, and that huge space dock, too, was was phenomenal, too. Like these massive ships are inside this massive space dock was was really cool to me. Just gave me scale and, you know, um, really put me in the moment. But, yeah, it, it definitely harkened back to the motion picture there, kind of seeing that ship. It it was really kind of cool. Well, you know, the, the nice thing about the, the motion picture refit enterprise is that it it truly looks good lit from any angle. You can look at it, you know, in every shot in the motion picture and it's gorgeous, no matter, you know, whether they're looking from, you know, the, the back of the nacelle back over the secondary hull in the saucer, you know, in that one shot from the aft view or straight on or, you know, dorsal view, it doesn't matter. The ship is gorgeous. And the Titan A I have to say is just as beautiful. And I think it, it has the same compliment. Every angle you look at this ship from, it is really beautiful to look at. And I have to believe that that was part of the calculus. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, um, yeah, I, I, it makes me wish Eagle Moss were still around because I need me a, a Titan A for sure. <laughs> yep. No, for I, sure. For uh, sure. If they ever release that as a model, I might have to actually try model building um, but that might be a disaster. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, JB, well, as always, we want it. No, I was going to say, if it, go, if it goes as well as my Enterprise D build, you're... <laughs> oh, I know, right? Yeah. So, Well, as always, we want to take a moment to thank our friends at Fansets for being the presenting sponsor of Trek Geeks. 
you know, it's been a long time since we've had the opportunity to talk about Lou and John and the whole team at Fansets. But just because we've been away doesn't mean they've slowed down with their awesome line of Star Trek pins one bit. They continue to release amazing new pins all the time. And here's just a few of their latest works of art. There's the Picard Finale Gold Delta in magnetic or pin form. Spoiler alert! Both versions of the Acting Ensign TNG Delta. That's right, there were two of them that Wesley wore, and both of them are available right now in magnet or pin form. The universe of Trek pins continue to impress with Christine Chapel from Strange New Worlds and Captain Benjamin Sisko from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And of course, don't forget the fansets line of mini deltas. Now you can get the Bajoran Com Badge mini pin, the Section 31 Delta mini pin, the Strange New Worlds Delta mini pin, and the Motion Picture Delta mini pin, all at fansets.com. And I said mini pin there about 30 times, so take that. Get yourself on over at fansets.com. Check out all of those pins and mini pins, plus all the other great new pins and put them all in your cart. Just do it already. And then be sure to enter the special discount code TREKGEEKS for 10% off your entire order. That's TREKGEEKS in all capital letters with no spaces. And of course, don't forget, when you spend more than $30, you automatically get free shipping inside the United States. Fansets. Our pins have character, and we thank our friends at Fansets for sponsoring TREKGEEKS. Well, Jamie, I'm going to put you on the spot here um, because this isn't in the outline. And I like to do this every now and then. I like to go call it Crazy Ivan and just do something absolutely nuts. If you had to pick one favorite element of this first episode of Picard's third season, what would it be for you? What stands out the most? Is it a performance? Is it a, is it a thing? Is it a scene? Is it a ship? What is it? For me, for me, it's the opening scene. The opening scene where we get introduced to Beverly Crusher, all the nostalgic elements that get introduced. You know, we we even see like her dedication plaques and her awards over the years and things that just bring us back to TNG, the sounds, the elements. So those nostalgic factors in that opening scene are is really my home run for this uh, first episode. Well. I, I can't agree. I can't, I mean, I can't argue with that one bit. I'm going to pick one of my own. I have to say, it's got to be Todd Stashwick's performance in those first scenes of Shaw around the dinner table. Um, I I like Malbec myself, but I don't mind Chateau Picard. Um, it, Todd just really delivers an amazing performance right off the bat. And um, it really makes me want to know more about the character. You know, we know that there's something not quite right about Shaw. And the way it gets uncovered really is just something to savor for the whole season. Yeah, um, no, I, totally. I, I, I love this character already as much as I think that he's a giant jerk in the first episode. Um, but it, it really makes me glad that they gave that character this introduction because yeah. it's just, it's, it's amazing to watch. Yeah, no, and it, it just, he, he puts you right on edge right in the beginning. You're like, okay, is he bad or yeah. is he just you know, a jerk. What, what is he, you know? And, and <laughs> what do we got here? Yeah. Yeah. What do we got? And, and that's, I remember that's how I felt. I, I, I felt seeing this like, Whoa, this guy is something else, but I immediately recognized, man, this is going to be a strong character throughout this season. Like I, I could just tell he was going to be a home run, you know, for sure. Well, I got to say, Jamie, season three is off to a solid start and we look forward to covering the rest of Picard's final season. Uh, why don't you tell us what's coming up next time here on Discovering Trek? On the next Discovering Trek Picard, aided by Seven of Nine and the crew of the USS Titan, Picard makes a shocking discovery that will alter his life forever and puts him on a collision course with the most cunning enemy he's ever encountered. Meanwhile, Rafi races to track a catastrophic weapon and collides with a familiar ally. Until then... Remember that you can describe, subscribe to Discovering Trek by searching for us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or by visiting trekgeeks.com. And of course, don't forget you can support Discovering Trek and the other Trek Geeks podcasts by subscribing to bonus content on Patreon, get access to the unedited audio of all our podcasts and a lot of other perks. It's great stuff. Uh, I know the t-shirts and, and pins have gone out recently and uh, well, there's, there's more on the way in the future. Let's just put it that way, Jamie. We'd also like to take a moment to recognize the following amazing producers of Discovering Trek, and we are so thankful for their support, and they are 
Mike Bovia, Steve Bovia, Chaz Bradshaw, Kyle Castillo, Peter Craig, Andy Davenport, Craig Hewing, Jackie and Chris Hackney, Kimberly Hartman, David Hood, Sean Lynn, Lionel Marchand, Matt McGonagall, Jim McMahon, Darren Metcalf, Charlie Mulvey, Sean O'Halloran, Casey Pettit, Jamie Rogers, Casey Shafsky, Terry Shull, Jim Stoffel, Chris Chabruzio, Ken Tripp, and the lovely and punctual Christina Werther. The senior producer of Trek Geeks is the wonderful and amazing Jude Tatman. Hey, Jude. Don't make it bad. If you want to support Discovering Trek and the other podcasts with Trek Geeks, beam on over to patreon.com slash trekgeeks today. Well, that's going to do it for episode one of Discovering Trek Picard season three. Jamie, thanks so much for joining me this week. I have a feeling we'll have more of the crew uh, in with us as the season progresses. But where can folks find you on social media? Um, I can be found at JMROG84 um, on Twitter and Instagram. Awesome. And uh, I can be found, of course, at Trek Geek Bill, just about most places. And of course, you can find all the Trek Geeks account at Trek Geeks on just about every social media platform. That'll do it for this episode of Discovering Trek the Card. We'll be back next time as we look at episode two, Disengage. Thanks so much for listening. And until next time, never stop discovering. Music for Discovering Trek is provided by Five Year Mission. They're writing an original song for each episode of Star Trek. Hear more of their music at fiveyearmission.net. Discovering Trek is a production of Coconut Media Works. Executive producers Bill Smith and Dan Davidson. For more great Star Trek discussion, discover the other shows of the Trek Geeks podcast network at trekgeeks.com or find us in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Thank you.